Intel's Alder Lake CPUs officially launched last week, with the rising star being this unlocked i5, the 12600K. This is a 6P plus 4E chip, meaning it has 6 of proper performance cores with 2 threads each, and 4 efficiency cores with no hyper-threading, making for 16 total threads. The P cores can clock up to 4.9GHz on this chip, with the E cores capped at up to 36 this, much like the, all of the Auto Lake chips that have launched at least so far, has a 125 watt base power rating and a much more modest 150 watt maximum turbo power rating compared to the i9's 241. So, how does this 6 and a bit core hold up against last gen 6 core and AMD's 6 and 8 core options? Well, starting with Cinebench R23 single-threaded, much like the i9, it holds a healthy lead over pretty much everything. It's 20% faster than both the last-gen 11600K and Ryzen 5600X, and 15% faster than the 5800X. Its score is still down from the 12900K thanks to no Turbo Boost 3.0 support and lower peak clock speeds across the board, but it's still a convincing lead so far. In multi-threaded, both thanks to that faster single core performance and those extra E cores, the 12600K trounces pretty much everything. It's 800 points clear of even the 5800X, or about 15% faster, and a whopping 60% faster than the 6 core parts. That is an excellent lead for sure, but what's more impressive is adding in the rest of the chips I've tested, and you'll notice that the 12600K actually sits on top of both the last gen i9-11900K and the i9-10850K from before. It's only bested by the Ryzen 5900X, which is a 12-core, and of course its bigger brother i9, the 12900K, but the fact that it's beating both last gen's top-end i9 and the generation before that's top-end i9, which I would remind you is a 10-core, well, that's incredibly impressive. In Blender and the BMW scene, the new i5 is still the fastest around, although the gap to the 5800X is a touch slimmer at more like 10%, but generation on generation? The 11600K runs 58% slower, with the 5600X only ahead just at 56% slower. That is a significant upgrade over the Rocket Lake chip, the one that launched in, oh yeah, March this year. In the Gooseberry render, that's actually quite a different story. Thanks to Intel's boost algorithm, punching hard at the start to only to slowly sink over time, and possibly some issues with the pre-release version of the BIOS that I've been testing all of these chips with, the 5800X actually overtakes the 12600K, with the new i5 running a shade under 10% slower. It's still faster than both of the uh, six core parts, the 11600K. Uh, I was gonna say last, like yeah, last years, but I guess last month is probably more accurate. Uh, either way, the 11600K and the Ryzen 5600X, although the gap to the 5600X is now down to just 25%. In Premiere Pro though, well, that's back to being king of the midfield netting a 5% lead over the 5800X, and around 20% advantage over the 6-core parts. In After Effects, rather interestingly, the last gen 11600K actually holds a convincing lead over, well, actually everything I've tested. Especially, uh, it's kind of especially strange because it even beats the higher core counts 12900 and 11900K, but it's actually confirmed in Photoshop where again the 11600K takes the lead over pretty much everything that I've tested this week and this thus far. If you've got any ideas for why that's the case, do feel free to leave me, uh, leave those in the comments down below because I'm 
quite bemused. Now, of course, most of you aren't overly concerned with rendering or editing performance. You care about gaming, and so do I, so let's take a look at those numbers. Testing at 1080p with an RTX 3080, in CSGO, the 12600K takes the back seat to both the 6 and 8 core Ryzen chips because they offer around 16% more performance. We are talking about 500 versus closing on 600 FPS though, so it's hardly a, a noticeable difference, but a win for AMD nonetheless. What is a win for Intel though is the generational improvement. 34% more performance than the 11600K, which is a fantastic step up. Cyberpunk is actually the complete opposite, with the 12600K taking a more noticeable victory, netting around 138 FPS average compared to the 11600K at around 117, and the Ryzen chips at 108 and 106. Also worth noting is the improvement in the 1% low figures, going from around 65 FPS to around 88 instead. Watch Dogs is also a clear victory for the new i5, running 149 FPS average and a stunning 112 in the 1% lows versus 116 and 86 in, uh, for the, the 11600K and both of the other Ryzen chips give or take one or two FPS. Microsoft Flight, uh, that swings back the other way, with AMD leading the pack by 18%, running around 20 FPS faster on average. And finally in Fortnite, well, that's pretty much a tie. The last gen i5 does run a touch slower, about 10 FPS, but I wouldn't call that a noticeable enough gap to, well, really take too much notice of it. I should make it clear, all of these benchmarks, or all of the benchmarks in this video and from the i9 review, have been using Windows 10. Now, I've run multiple sets of complete benchmarks on all of the chips uh, on both Windows 10 and Windows 11 at this point, but I've had countless bugs and issues using Windows 11. I've had ex insane amounts of inconsistency, both on the new chips and on even the, the existing ones that in theory should work just fine. Uh, and so while I did verify the 12th gen chips results using Windows 11 to make sure that there wasn't any significant performance differences using Windows 10 with these new chips, the Windows 10 results overall were considerably more accurate and consistent, so that's what I've been using. Now most reviews of these chips would leave it here, but I think that that's a little almost short-sighted, and I think it leaves out a lot of interesting detail, since these aren't just another chip. This is two CPUs pretending to be one, so let's test them separately and see how they do. Now, testing the P-cores on their own is easy, you just disable all of the E-cores in the BIOS and test away, but getting the E-cores on their own is harder, as you can't disable all of the P-cores, all but one, uh, and so what I did was disable all but one P-core, enable all of the E-cores, and then using a mixture of both a task manager to set CPU affinity, basically telling the scheduler what cores the programs are allowed to use, and running games like Fortnite with a command prompt, a sort of preset affinity, uh, as its anti-cheat engine blocks any attempts to change the affinity once it's running, well, then you can test both the E-cores and P-cores independently. So, how do they both fare? Well, in Cinebench R23, the P-cores score around 13,500 points, putting it a sizable chunk below the 8-core 5800X, although still 25% faster than the 11600K and 5600X. The E-cores, meanwhile, well, they get outperformed by pretty much anything you could throw at them. Even an i3-10100 offers better performance, around 50% more actually, at least in multi-threaded work. In single-threaded, 
Well, the P cores actually gain a fraction more performance than with both types of cores enabled. That's potentially thanks to the extra power budgets or just the scheduler being able to accidentally, or I suppose not being able to accidentally drop a thread onto an e-core for any amount of time. As for the e-cores, well, they're about 12% slower than a 10100 on single threaded work. But what's more interesting for me is the power usage. I was seeing between 26 and 30 watts being drawn from the four e-cores themselves, around 36 watts for the whole chip. When you compare that to the 10100, which in my previous testing uh, drew just 46 watts at peak, well, that's only around 30% higher, but the i3 offers 50% more performance. Conceivably then, an underclocked i3 could actually match the power uh, usage of the e-cores and still outperform them. Of course, space efficiency is also key with this design, but I think that that's an interesting comparison nonetheless. Where it gets really interesting though, is in the gaming performance. In CSGO, the P-Cores match the stock results, although actually outpace them in the 1% low figures. The E-Cores though, that is a rough gaming experience. While technically it does garner 230 FPS average, there was a significant amount of hitching, frame drops and stuttering that made playing incredibly difficult if not impossible and far from enjoyable. In Cyberpunk, the P-Cores on their own actually outperformed the stock results, both on average and in the 1% lows, and by a reasonable enough margin. It's certainly not night and day or anything like that, but I think it shows both the issues with the scheduler having to deal with these hybrid core designs, and that the e-cores can actually be a hindrance to performance in at least some games. As for the e-cores on their own, that was, again, a, a pretty horrific experience. You go from getting 140, 130 FPS average to just 42, and the number of hitches, frame drops, and just general stuttering, even things like the audio cutting out in-game for a short period made it a pretty impossible gaming experience, even if the frame rate itself isn't quite as bad as I've had before, but yeah, that was, uh, that was not a great experience. As for Watch Dogs Legion, the anti-cheat software that they use actually refused to let the game even launch while only on the e-cores with one p-core active. Actually, both th uh, that happened on the, both this i5 and the i9 with eight e-cores, so it's not an immediate thread problem, but it still refused to even run in either configuration. The P-Cores actually dropped a, a touch of performance compared to the, the stock results, although again, it's hardly by a, a large fall and still well clear of anything else I've tested. Microsoft Flights, much like the i9 actually, saw a significant increase in performance on the P-Cores alone. It's still not quite at the same level as both of the Ryzen chips, running around 9 FPS lower on average, but it's a full 12 FPS higher than the stock results, which is pretty significant at this sort of performance range, as it's not far off 10% more performance for disabling the e-cores. Speaking of them, they actually didn't do as badly as I thought they would. There was still some hitching and frame drops, especially when you're giving inputs, but on the whole, it still managed a relatively respectable 80 FPS average, which is honestly impressive. Finally, in Fortnite, the P cores uh, pretty much stayed the same. Technically, they rose a little, but certainly not enough to take note of. Although what is worth noting is the halved performance from the E cores alone. Now, uh, remarkably, the, the actual playing experience 
wasn't as bad as you might think with the, the halved FPS, especially because the halved FPS is still over 120, and while it's nowhere near as good as the, the full fat chips, again, it's still very impressive how well it ended up performing. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is pricing. Intel has gone hard here, setting the 12600K around £290 in the UK. For context, the last gen 11600K is now around £220, AMD's Ryzen 5600X can be found for about £270, and their 5800X is a whopping £370. Considering the new i5 can outpace even the 5800X, even in CPU specific workloads, and should in theory be faster in uh, the majority of games, £290 seems like an absolute bargain, but the key words there were seems like. That's because while the chip itself is very competitively priced, the second you actually start to try and use it, the costs start piling up. First is a motherboard. Z690 boards seem to start at around £200, whereas AMD's B550 platform can be had for more like 120 to 150 for a very competent board, or hell, you can get an updated B450 board on eBay for under 100 Then there is the RAM. While you can buy a motherboard that supports DDR4, performance is meant to be generally less than ideal, so to get the most out of your new chip, you will need to spend over double the price of DDR4 to get yourself some shiny new DDR5, like the Corsair Vengeance kits I've been using in a lot of my testing. Luckily, the power draw isn't quite as insane as it is on the i9, and while it can still draw around 70% more power than a 5600X, it's still generally low enough that most 240mm AIOs that you may or may not be already buying should handle it just fine. So taking the, the added cost of the motherboard alone, you're easily comparing price-wise to a 5800X instead, and if you go for DDR5, well, then you're comparing to a 5900X instead, and that's pretty much a no-brainer, at least if raw CPU horsepower is what you're after. Don't get me wrong, this is an impressive chip. The P-cores themselves and the performance from them is fantastic. It's a sizable improvement over the last generation, and a comfortable lead over AMD's 6-core offering, and actually should perform better in at least most games, albeit it might be hard to tell the difference, and if you're gaming at 1440p, there's really not going to be all that much difference at all, but when you add the, the e-cores, I feel like that adds unneeded complexity and a slew of bugs that I expect will take a number of months to properly iron out. Personally, I would hold off on buying this one and pick up the rumoured 6P plus 0E design, and since that will likely be locked anyway, a cheaper B your H series motherboard. I think that would be a real killer option and an exceptional value. It shouldn't bring too many bugs and have a pretty incredible performance and probably value proposition to boot. I think that's the chip that AMD should be afraid of, and the one that you should be excited for. As it stands, I think the disclaimer I gave in the i9 review that if you buy any of these Alder Lake chips at launch, you're going to be a beta tester, is still relevant here. Like I said, I had a number of issues, both with Windows 11 and BIOS issues, including basic things like not being able to set memory timings and frequency at the same time, and while I hope that those sorts of things will be ironed out in future BIOS revisions, that's future BIOS revisions and I can't review uh, something that doesn't exist yet, uh, and so for those sorts of reasons, the, the added complexity of those e-cores, which as you saw in some cases can hurt performance, especially in games, I feel like a more simplified version, which is a sort of a, a just a new version of the, the p-cores alone, a, a new sort of 11600K generationally, I think that would make for a much better well, overall user experience. Now, with that said, you've heard my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. 
What do you think about the 12600K? Is this the, the chip for you? Are you picking one up now? Or are you going to hold off until the, the bugs die down? Or hold off for a, that rumoured 6P, 6P plus 0E? Or maybe go with Ryzen instead? Or are you just not upgrading right now because you just don't need to? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. I'll leave a link to uh, especially the 12600K, but also to Z690 motherboards, to some DDR5, and probably some of the Ryzen chips as well if you're interested. Those will all be Amazon affiliate links that will take you to your local Amazon store, where you can see pricing when and where you watch this, because obviously I'm here in the UK and quoting UK pricing, but it might be different for you, so do take a look. I'll leave those in the description for you. I'll also leave a load of other links in the description if you want to support the channel and support these videos. There have been a lot of work, a lot of, well, very long days and late nights to get everything benchmarked and tested and verified as well. So if you do want to support, there is a load of links in the description you can check out. There's also, of course, that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of these new videos as I have a lot more things to test with these chips and of course plenty of other normal reviews in the meantime as well and you can also check out the youtube join button for access to our money men discord chat sponsor free videos and some cool emojis to use in the comments and on our weekly live streams as well you could also support on Patreon instead, there's a link in the description for that. There's affiliate links to places like Overclocks UK if you're buying from there. And of course there will be plenty of other videos on the end cards if you want to keep watching. If you haven't already, I highly recommend you check out both the i9 review and the Z690 Explained video uh, as there's a lot more detail and uh, things tested in there as well. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, leave those in the comments down below. We'll see you on the next video.